All right, everyone, let's get to it. Welcome class to Classics 160D2, Classical Mythology. And today, the final like content-based lecture for the course, uh, 15.2, Myth in the Modern World. For all of you wondering out there, what game is Dr. Rob playing these days? Well, I'm actually getting ready to play uh, the new Half-Life game for virtual reality. Uh, Half-Life Alex, but I never played the original Half-Lifes, even though I was like your age when they were coming out. And so I'm actually starting back with the original Half-Life, and then I'll probably play Half-Life 2, and then go to Half-Life Alex. But that's just the plan. Um, what else do I play? Uh, played the new God of War recently, obviously that one was awesome. Not the new, new one. Well, yeah, no, I guess it is the new one, but yeah. Anyway, yes, I played that. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Uh, big fan of all the Zelda games. I actually just played through uh, the original Zelda for Nintendo, and it is so hard. It is incredibly, incredibly difficult. And it keeps track of how many times you die, like next to your like character name at the beginning. And I think I died something like 124 times or something during my, my playthrough. Um, so anyway, I got some work to do. Not, not exactly an ace, but uh, that's what I'm playing these days. Uh, anyway, let's talk about mythology and the modern world. Um, what we've got on the uh, docket for today, announcements and a few recaps. Um, we are going to talk about myth and geography, myth and marketing, myth and medicine, and finally myth in the media, especially in literature. So that is the plan for today's class. All right, announcements. You guys know this all by now, hopefully. Go ahead and put this thing in speaker view up in the right-hand corner. Just go right up there, and you can find your speaker view. Uh, and then if you have any questions, go ahead and shoot your TA a uh, question, and they will funnel that to me. Uh, big things to note. The project is due two days from right now, right before class on Friday. All right, and then that will be done. You can forget about it over the weekend and just focus on studying for the exam which will be next Wednesday, all right? Um, if you're interested in presenting, there are a couple slots left. You can find the, uh, the spreadsheet on D2L under today's class or under Friday's class. Feel free to put your name in. Um, again, the idea for that, say a few words about yourself, what your topic is, why that was of interest to you, why you chose the format you did, and then give us a little snippet of it, right? It doesn't have to be the whole two hour long movie you presented, or uh, not presented, put together. Yeah. Anyway, your TA will watch that. They'll love it. Uh, but we'll go for like maybe two minutes of it. And, um, but we are excited to see what you put together. And this is always like for sure. One of the, the favorite kind of moments in my class when I see like, you know, when I look out upon all of you and you're like falling asleep on your zooms or just doing something completely like unrelated to class while I'm teaching. And I'm like, Oh man, oh, they're not getting anything out of class. And then, then on project day, a couple of you come forward and I see what you've produced and I'm like, this is brilliant. This is incredible. And so it's undeniably one of my favorite days of the semester. Uh, you guys also have to be there. Uh, even if you're not presenting, we are going to do um, uh, attendance on Friday because it's important that you learn to support your peers and your classmates and your colleagues. Be there for support. Um, and uh, see what they've produced. Okay, uh, so here's the game plan for the week, right? We are done with Monday's uh, thematic lecture on mythology and sports. Wednesday, we've got a, uh, that is today. It's Myth in the Modern World. That's what we're doing today. Friday, uh, student presentations. Monday is a review session. Friday is an exam. You don't have to show up to the Zooms for the exam. Just go on to D2L, click through. It'll be ready to go. Now we got a couple other announcements today. Uh, student course surveys are live now. Um, and I'm not sure that you have them for all your classes. I think it was kind of an opt-in thing, but I feel like relatively speaking, this thing's gone pretty well. Um, and so like, if you have a few minutes, I would super appreciate if you take the time to do them. Um, and a couple things on that, uh, you know, on that front one, like hopefully, you know, that like, I do put a lot of work into this and I really am trying to make it a good course and I always want to get better, right? Um, so anything specific you've got in terms of like things that are working really, really well or specific things where it's like, that was absolutely awful, please, please make it better. Maybe you don't have to say it was absolutely awful. Frame it in a constructive manner. Um, and uh, then like all Amazon reviews, right? Just give it the old five-star click 
so that I can forward these to my department head and uh, <laughs> try to get her to tell me that I'm a good teacher. But if you take the time to do that, I would just very, very much appreciate it. Uh, projects, yep, do Friday at class time. Again, the idea is that your research for these, the research is done, right? You are now at this point simply translating this into some cool, engaging digital format. Um, you know, if it's, uh, oh, this is a good logistical point. Uh, if it's either complicated to engage with, right? Like you have to install something or whatever, right? Um, or if it's like a huge file, right? You did produce your two hour movie. It's like 24 gigabytes. Like, so, like make sure that we can access it somehow. If it is a really large file, the best way to do that is either put it into box or put it on Google Drive or put it on YouTube and then submit a link. And if you do put it in Box or Google Drive, you also have to make sure to set the permissions so that uh, people with a U of A email address uh, can access that so your TA can actually see how awesome you did. Uh, one question coming through here. Uh, if we do a website, would you prefer a link or screenshots? Uh, if you do something like a website, go ahead and actually submit the, uh, the link, right? Um, and that's fine, right? If you're doing a big movie and you can only submit a link, YouTube and a link, uh, website and a link. All you gotta do is just go ahead and like put the link into like a PDF or like a Word file or something and just submit that and you're good to go, right? We can handle it from there. Um, but really do try to make it accessible. And TAs, if you're going through those and you hit any broken links or anything like that, um, I know you guys are, be kind and compassionate. I know you guys already are. But just shoot the, the student an email and be like, hey, like, I think your link's broken. Don't be like, zero percent. Boom. Do better next time. No, just, just you know, send them an email. I'm sure that something just got messed up. But uh, try to make those accessible and make them awesome um, because, yeah, because it's fun. And because part of the goal here is for you to, for you to kind of learn how to take something that's academic, right, and detailed and nuanced and present it, right, in an engaging format. That really is an awesome skill to be able to have. Okay, what do we have next? Late work, okay? Um, I'm sure nobody out there is behind at all, but if you are, right, even just a little bit, uh, I have got a relatively generous late work policy here, all right? Um, if you get it in within a day, you can still get up to 90%. Within a week, it's still 70%. If you missed like reading response three and you're like, oh man, that's gonna be the difference between an A and a B or a B and a C or passing or not passing, go back and do it, right? 50% is so much more than 0% um, and you don't have to like send it specifically to the TA or anything like that. Just drop it in the normal folder. Like what we see on our end, we can always see like new submissions and so we'll make sure before we wrap up grading the course that we go into all those folders that have new submissions and make sure that you get your credit where credit is due. Uh, for the exam itself, right? This is gonna be the exact same as the midterm, same amount of time. Um, and uh, TAs, one of you guys remind me on Friday to, uh, to do the accommodations. Um, I'm going to try to remember, but I, I forget these sometimes. If you need accommodations, get those requests in now because I'm going to put them in Friday um, and we'll make sure that they're good to go by Wednesday. But same amount of time, right? 50 minutes to do the thing. Same amount of questions. 25 multiple choice. That'll be worth half of the thing. One essay. That's the other half of the thing. You can use your notes. So spend this time kind of getting your notes together, getting organized. Um, again, the... Multiple choice are just on the second half of the class. The essay is going to be fair game for anything kind of in the course. Um, yeah, if you're doing something um, that's, uh, yeah, what was it? the question was, we're doing some sort of like brochure. Uh, you can just do the, um, yeah, you can just submit the Word file, whatever, whatever like Word or PDF, that's easily accessible. Uh, by the TAs. So if you can get it into one of those uh, formats, that's good to go there. Um, okay, good, good, good. Yeah. 
So last time we were talking about sports, right? And we started off talking about like the earliest days of sports and how a lot of it is very much in the eye of the beholder, right? Like we see these things that are kind of sports related. We go to the palace of Knossos, right? On the island of Crete. And we're looking at all this like bull imagery, right? People leaping over the backs of bulls in frescoes and in figurines and in signet seals and in rhytons. And uh, in some ways, this embodies some of the characteristics of what we would consider sport, right? Athleticism, performance, that sort of thing. Uh, but it might not have all the characteristics. We don't know whether it was competitive. We don't know whether there was winners or losers. We don't know whether they got, they got like prizes for winning, that sort of thing. Um, and it really uh, is not until the Homeric world, right? Where he's describing the funeral games of Patroclus where we get our first evidence for something that like almost all of us would consider sports, right? Where it's very clearly competitive. You're competing against other people. It is like a, a, a contest of physical skill. There are prizes, there are spectators, all of those things. And interestingly, right around the same time that Homer is creating this text, right? We're also getting the first Olympics going back to 776 BCE. And one of the cool things is that when we look at Olympia, right, we frequently think of it just as like a sports type thing. But when you go to Olympia and you look at the site, this is very, very intimately intertwined with religion and mythology, right? All you got to do is look at the, the site plan, right? And you see the Temple of Zeus and this monument to Pelops and the Temple of Hera and the Metroon and the Altar of Zeus and the Hippodamion, right? All of these things have to do with mythology and religion. And then you walk through the little like uh, the little archway and you enter the stadium. And that's where the games take place, all in honor uh, primarily of Zeus. And we can look at that stadium today, right? It's kind of cool in the sense that it actually doesn't look all that different than it would have looked in antiquity. There really isn't the same type of superstructure in Greek uh, sports architecture that we get in Roman sports architecture uh, or in, in modern sports architecture, right? So spectators would have just sat on the kind of grassy banks here. You do have a little space set off for the judges. There would have been a statue over here. But what you're looking at are the starting lines here. Uh, and again, what we end up seeing with the Olympics is a long progression from the very, very beginning where it was one single event, just a foot race, right? Uh, all the way towards like what we have today and even in antiquity, right? The, the number of events proliferated as time went on. And one of the things we saw at the end of yesterday or Monday's class was that that's not the only set of games in Greek antiquity. We actually have a set of four Pan-Hellenic games, four sets of games where city-states from all over the Greek world would have come together to compete. So the Olympics is the big one, right? But there are also games at the site of Delphi, Right, known as the Pythian Games. And you can see if you if you walk all the way up to the top of the site, at the very, very top, we've got the stadium, this time with its Roman seating, right? The Roman stone seating built up around it. And those, of course, were in honor of Apollo. And for those, you got the, the laurel wreath, if you want. We also have the Isthmian Games, right? Right at the isthmus that connects uh, Attica, where Athens is, to the Peloponnese, down where uh, Sparta is. Um, right next to the big city of Corinth. And those games, right, near the water, very logically dedicated to Poseidon. And then finally, we get the Nemean games, right? Also kind of close to this site as well, um, a little bit southwest of Corinth. Uh, and these were also dedicated to Zeus. And so again, these games end up being come, becoming a part, uh, kind of an integral part of Greek culture, of what it means to be Greek, right? Something that brings Greek city-states that are ruled by different political systems and totally independent governments, right, together as a single people. And when we think of religion, right, in many ways that's doing the same thing. So we've got sports bringing different Greek city-states together, we've got religion bringing different Greek city-states together, and then you think about other things in terms of culture, um, cultural beliefs and practices also bringing uh, Greek city-states together. And we finished by talking about some of the major differences, right? All these things are modern constructions, the idea that it travels around the world, right? The, the restart actually took place in Athens, not Olympia. The rings, the medals, the torch, 
uh, the, or the torch, not race, but the torch procession. Um, that's all modern stuff there. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to jump on to today's lecture, uh, kind of actually building off of the, the legacy of the Olympics, but looking at mythology in the modern world. And one of the places you see this kind of most frequently uh, is with geography, right? You can think of like many, many, many different cities and places and sites that are built directly off of Greco-Roman mythology. Let's try to think really creatively here, right? What's, uh, what's one that's kind of close to us right now? I don't actually know if this is the next slide or not. I forget what order these are in. Oh, it is, right? Phoenix, yeah, Phoenix, Arizona, very, very clearly built directly off of Greek mythology, right? So we didn't talk much about this in the class, but the Phoenix, right, is the mythical bird reportedly, uh, repeatedly born again and again and again, right? Rising from the ashes of its predecessor. And the kind of story behind this uh, is that when Phoenix was actually founded in the, the kind of mid uh, middle of the 19th century, the founder uh, basically had traveled through the Southwest and seen all the kind of uh, Pueblo um, archeological remains uh, of some of those sites, places like Chaco Canyon. And so when he, he got to Phoenix and he wanted to found this city, he pictured the city kind of rising from the ashes um, of those, those uh, civilizations. Now, uh, from a modern perspective, just to uh, clarify here, especially because my partner does like Native American archeology span and her big thing is like working with native groups in the, the Southwest. Uh, the idea that we're just dealing with a bunch of like archeological remains in the Southwest and that all group native groups had like disappeared and now we must emerge from those ashes is completely false. And he's totally wrong about that, right? There are many native groups thriving in the Southwest today. Um, but, uh, that's how the, the guy who founded the city pictured things. And that's why Phoenix gets the name that it does. Okay. And that's not all right. We got Oracle, Arizona, um, founded in the 1870s and named after a ship the founder had traveled on. Um, and the ship itself was then of course named after the Oracle at Delphi. Um, and the idea was that this place, uh, kind of like Tucson, uh, actually becomes a retreat for people suffering uh, from tuberculosis, right? So that the Southwest is known very much as a place you want to go to recover um, from any sort of illness. Maybe ironic now since we're a COVID hotspot. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else do we got? Athens, right? Very popular name. Uh, you kind of wonder, it makes you wonder sometimes why people aren't more creative with their city names. Uh, but we've got 19 cities named Athens in the United States. Uh, so we've got two of them actually in Ohio, where I grew up. Um, Georgia, a big one, obviously, where the University of Georgia is. Uh, in Ohio, it's where the University of Ohio, or Ohio University is. Um, yeah, so Athens is a big one. Um, Atlanta. And so this is actually an interesting one. There are actually like um, kind of two theories here in terms of why Atlanta is named Atlanta. Uh, so it gets this name from this guy, J. Edgar Thompson, who's the uh, chief engineer of the Georgia Railroad, right? Railroad tycoon at the time. And so one account says that he came up with the name based on uh, the name of the daughter of the governor, right? Like kind of like a way to name the city and, and curry some good favor with somebody of great political importance at the time. Uh, another theory is that he just feminized the word like Atlantic, right? And tried to come up with a, a feminine word there. Um, and came up with Atlanta because it's kind of sort of near the Atlantic. It's not really on the water. Um, and still another theory, right? Like, uh, well, I guess this would be the theory if he was naming it after the daughter of the governor. Uh, that middle name there, Atalanta, we've already heard the story here, right? This uh, comes from one of the heroines of Greek mythology who's born to a king, but she always wanted to be a guy. And so uh, the king wants to get rid of her. But of course, she doesn't end up dying. She's raised by this she-bear, right? Takes a vow of virginity, dedicates herself to Artemis, and becomes an incredibly fierce uh, and powerful huntress, right? So going on uh, quests like hunting the Caledonian boar, getting into this foot race with Hippomenes, traveling, right? Being one of the females to travel with Jason and the Argonauts. 
Now, that's not the only thing that we have kind of sort of uh, that sounds like this. We do have the Atlantic Ocean and the Atlas Mountains. Um, and the one of the cool things, right, is the idea of the Atlantic Sea, right, or the Atlantic Ocean goes all the way back to like ancient Greek times. Um, and so originally, right, the sea gets its name because that's the body of water that's next to the Atlas Mountains. And we actually heard much, much earlier, right, how that uh, body of mountains, body of mountains, range of mountains gets its name, right? Uh, so Perseus, again, is traveling back after he's killed the Medusa and Atlas um, uh, ends up trying to fight him or knock him down or something like that. And he gives him the old, um, uh, uh, gives the Titan the old like Medusa and turns him to stone, calling him the Atlas Mountains. Um, okay, so we've got uh, Atalanta, we've got Atlas and the Atlantic. Um, we've got 18 different cities named Aurora. And we haven't talked much about the goddess Aurora, but it's the Roman name uh, of the Greek goddess Eos, who's the goddess of the dawn. And every morning, right, she flies across the sky announcing the arrival of the sun. And then Helios or Apollo in his chariot follows behind bringing daylight. Um, now, one of the other stories associated with Aurora is a good life lesson here. And uh, one of the stories associated with her is she falls in love with this mortal, Tithonus. And he's a, he's a prince of Troy. Um, and eventually, after begging Zeus many, many times, she gets him to grant Tithonus immortality, right? Like, what a wonderful way that they can spend forever together. But the life lesson here is, in addition to that, you always, always, always have to ask for eternal youth as well. And so Tithonus does not get this. And so even though he lives forever, he just keeps getting older and older and older and wrinklier. And, 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 this. and so, like, I can only assume that, like, I don't know, after 30 or 40 or 50 years, Aurora was like, I really, I really botched that one. I should have asked for eternal youth or just skipped the thing altogether and just, I don't know, made out with one of the gods instead of immortal. Anyway. Let's move on. All right, 25 cities in the United States named Troy. The connection here is not a difficult one, right? It's named after the city of Troy, right? In Western Anatolia, modern day Turkey, the site of the Trojan War, right? Of course, recounted um, in uh, Homer's Iliad. Um, one of the cool kind of things there, right, is that 200 years ago, we didn't even know if this was a real place. And it was the archeologist Heinrich Schliemann, who for all his failures, if you ever like research the guy, terrible archeologist in many, many ways, just goes looting everything. Um, like he'll find stuff. He like dresses up his wife and like the, the, the gold and si like silver that he finds at the site of Mycenae. You're not supposed to do that if you're an archeologist. Um, but he like finds the city of Troy uh, in Western Turkey, and you can go visit it uh, today. Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, so this is actually where I grew up. It's named after the former Roman consul Cincinnatus. Um, and the story behind Cincinnatus uh, is this is way, way, way back in the very early days of the Roman Republic. And so it was when Rome was still just kind of a little just a little turd of a city, you know, just a little turd of a city, not doing very much. And they're still relatively weak compared to their neighbors. And so their neighbors, the Iqui, uh, they end up coming over to Rome, starting to pick on Rome, and Rome is feeling the heat. Now, at the time, the way Roman government set up, we mentioned this very, very briefly a couple weeks ago, uh, is that it's run by two consuls, right? They had gotten rid of the kings, and the new idea was that Two consuls will always stay in power, right? A way to balance each other, make sure things don't get too crazy, um, like under uh, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, or Tarquin the Proud. Now, the problem with that is that when you have multiple people trying to make decisions, frequently they can take a while, right? Because people don't always agree on the best way to do things. And as a result, what ends up happening is Rome develops a position known as the dictator, right? We have that word today, very negative connotations today. In the early days of ancient Rome, this wasn't a bad connotation thing, right? Basically, in times of emergency, they would appoint a dictator, 
that dictator would have sole control over everything for six months. And the idea is that that allows them to efficiently deal with any types of crisis that need immediate action. Okay, so Cincinnatus was a formal consul. After, after his year doing that, he went and he was like going to do his farming, right? Just being a good Roman farmer. And they came to him, they're like, we're about to get our butts kicked. Can you please take over the role of dictator and help us out? And good old Cincinnatus here is like, absolutely, no big deal. I got gotcha. you. And so he like leaves his plow and, and goes back to the, the capital, you know, the, the center of the city and takes over the army. And within like two weeks is able to defeat the, uh, the invading tribe, like really, really soundly defeat them. Uh, where in the end, he makes them walk out. Uh, it's called like under the yoke. And like, you know, the thing that you put like over oxen to like keep them like, I don't know, keep them linked together. He makes uh, the, the Ikwi like walk out like that under one of those things, like people next to each other. Um, and he does it in like two weeks. Amazing like military victory. And that's only half of it. The big kicker, the reason why we remember Cincinnatus today the reason why the ancient Romans loved this dude and the reason why a city like Cincinnati gets his name after him is because after that, he had five and a half more months of being the sole ruler in Rome. But instead of doing that, he's just like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm going back to my farm. I'm going to get my farm on. I'm going to make some grapes. I'm going to farm some olives, maybe make a little bit of wine, maybe grow some grain. But I don't need the political power anymore. I'm giving that back to the consuls. And especially during the end of the Roman Republic, when things are absolutely bonkers and all the consuls are trying to take the Roman armies and kill each other with them. Uh, they look back at Cincinnati as this like total, like ideal beacon of like political righteousness where when called to do so, he steps up and he does his job uh, on behalf of Rome, right? Uh, politically and militarily. And then as soon as that's done, he gives up voluntarily power and goes back to the farm. So good old Cincinnati uh, in the city of Cincinnati. All right. So next up, we have got uh, quite a lot of mythological uh, references in marketing today. The most obvious of which is Nike, right? So the whole brand of Nike uh, is named after the goddess Nike, right? Or Athena Nike, Athena, the goddess of Nike. And she's the personification of victory, right? Um, and kind of along with that kind of sort of strength and speed along with it, one of the versions of, of Athena there. Uh, now she's very, very frequently depicted with wings. So if you remember back to the statue that's inside of the Parthenon or that was, um, she's like the, the big Athena is holding a little Athena Nike, uh, with the wings. What you're looking at here is, um, uh, a recreation of the, uh, the Nike of Samothrace or the winged victory of Samothrace, uh, which is one of the most famous depictions of her. Doesn't have a head anymore, but incredibly, uh, detailed statue there. And that's where we get the, uh, the, the little like swoosh that goes with the Nike shoes, right? It's supposed to be the wings of the goddess of victory. And if you have any of the following names, right? Nick, Nicole, uh, Veronica, any of those names, um, those all like have at their root uh, Nike, right? So some version of victory. Uh, the Midas Tire Company, right? So this is named, of course, after King Midas um, because everything the tire company touches turns to gold. And, it doesn't make total sense there. Um, but uh, in antiquity, right, um, Midas was like, uh, you know, one of these legendary kind of kings uh, who somehow gets this kind of blessing slash curse that anything he touches turns to gold. And the way this happens is he finds this kind of drunk satyr, this guy Salinas, um, and he, he gets any wish he wants. And so this is what he actually wishes for. And if of course, what ends up happening is that at the beginning, he ends up like being really happy. He's getting all this gold. Then he realizes that basic things, food and drink, his family, anything he touches like that turns to gold as well. And he realizes he's made a huge mistake. Now, one of the super cool things is that we actually have archaeological, like real historical and archaeological evidence for this dude. Like King Midas was a real guy, 
probably didn't have the touch of gold. But you can get the sense for why a myth like that crops up because the Greeks thought this guy was really filthy, stinking rich. And so he was in Anatolian Phrygia, so a little bit like further east than like the kind of west coast of Turkey, right? You got the west coast of Turkey, go a little bit further east into central Turkey. That's where Phrygia is. Um, and that's where uh, King Midas would have ruled. And one of the, uh, the cool things, his name was King Mita um, in the original language. Uh, and we've got his actual tomb. So this giant hill over here, this is a giant tumulus inside of which King Midas is buried. And this was excavated in the middle, middle of the late part of the 20th century by the University of Pennsylvania. And his body's still in there, right? So we actually still have the body of King Midas. Uh, and they did a reconstruction of his like skull and head. And he kind of looks like, I don't know, he kind of looks like a really boring like accountant or something. Like, like a guy who would do your taxes, kind of. But anyway, that's King Midas. One of the other cool things is that excavating the tomb, they actually found, like, tons of feasting vessels, right? Um, so over a hundred different eating and drinking um, vessels and things related to eating and drinking and feasting uh, inside the tomb as well. Unfortunately, they were not gold. They were, like, some silver, mostly bronze vessels. But still a very, very wealthy burial. And even cooler than that is that one of the guys who works at the University of uh, Pennsylvania is big into like um, a kind of experimental archaeology and in particular uh, food and drink and antiquity. And so they did a lot of um, uh, basically residue analyses so they could figure out like what was inside of these vessels. And what it was is it's kind of like a weird, it, it's kind of like a beer but also with like honey and spices in it, it sounds really, really gross. But they used this residue uh, to actually partner um, with, uh, I think it's the Dogfish Brewing Company, uh, to recreate a series of ancient beers. And so they actually have a beer called the Midas Touch, which is uh, based on the residue analysis of the tomb of King Midas. Um, so, I don't know, very, very cool stuff. I've never tried it, but I, I wanna track it down and, and try it sometime. Um, it looks, from the picture, it looks like it's like 9% alcohol. So it, that beer will pack a punch. Anyway, King Midas, real guy, drinking weird beers. <laughs> uh, Trident gum, right? Uh, so obviously named after Poseidon's weapon. And the reason it gets that name is it was supposedly had three enzymes uh, that prevented cavities, just like the three points on the trident. What else do we have here? Uh, the Orion Movie Company, I'm not sure this even exists anymore, but they thought, like the people who formed it, thought that the constellation had five stars, like a five-star review. It actually has many more stars than that. Um, but anyway, that's what, named after Orion. You guys remember the myth, right? It was like, uh, in one, um, they were like, uh, Artemis and Apollo uh, were hunting, right? And Artemis was in love with Orion, but Apollo gets her to like shoot him when he's like swimming away. And then he gets put up in the sky. Uh, the other version, right, um, is that Orion tries to have his way with Artemis. That obviously doesn't work out well. The third version um, is that they're like hunting buddies together, but Orion starts like bragging a little bit too much. And he's like, I'm gonna kill all the animals everywhere. And then like Hera sends a giant scorpion to do battle with him. And then they both get put up in the sky as like uh, as constellations, right? So a couple different versions of the story of Orion and Artemis. But that's what the, the movie company was named after, ostensibly because it had five stars. It has many more than five stars, but there you go. Um, we've got the Aegis Insurance Company, right? Uh, so the Aegis is the shield carried uh, by Athena and sometimes by Zeus. Um, frequently when you see statues of Athena, you'll see the Aegis uh, right on her um, uh, her breastplate as well there. And it's got the, uh, the, the Medusa there, right? As extra protection to turn anybody to stone who looks at this thing. And, you know, the logic here makes a lot of sense, I think, right? That like the Aegis is like a protective device um, and it makes sense for because a, an insurance company is gonna protect you uh, and, and its clients, right, from any 
any disasters that might occur. Then we've got Ajax, Ajax the Cleaner. And this is somebody who very clearly read their, uh, their Iliad right growing up. Um, and Ajax is like, he's like the physically strongest of all the Greek fighters, right? Maybe second to Achilles, but he's known for just being an absolute beast. And so Ajax, right, it's like stronger than dirt. I, I don't know how Ajax would actually feel if that was like the big comparison. Um, and uh, then also, yes, stronger than Greece. That's the other one uh, that's associated uh, with Ajax, right? Stronger than dirt. Stronger than Greece, get it? Greece, um, good pun there. And um, and you know the the kind of story ends not so great for Ajax. Turns out after Achilles dies, uh, Ajax and Odysseus end up doing battle. Right? They they want the honor of getting Achilles' armor, and then uh, Ajax loses, and then he kills himself. And it's I don't know, kind of a dark. That's probably not what they're going for in the, the illusion, um, but very, very strong. Stronger than dirt, stronger than grease. We've got a couple car companies. Uh, the lesson you're gonna find here is don't name your car company after Greek mythology, Greek or Roman mythology. Um, we've got the Mercury Car Company, doesn't exist anymore. Used to be a branch of the Ford Motor Company. Uh, Mercury, right, the messenger god. You can kind of see the relationship there, right? Gets you places quickly, um, helps travelers along the road, right? Gets, pla gets people places safely. Um, and the little, like, logo here, right, was supposed to be um, an allusion to either the wings on the sandals or the wings on the helmet, that sort of thing. So, you can help. Mercury doesn't exist anymore, but you can at least get the idea, right? Uh, we've also got the Saturn car company. That one's a little bit weirder, right? Also doesn't really exist, I don't think, anymore. But it's the car if you want to eat your babies. I don't know. <laughs> um, but it gets uh, overthrown, right? Or the company gets overthrown, just like Cronus does. Um, or, you know. Saturn. So there you go. Don't name your car company after a mythological thing. Uh, Olympus camera is kind of cool. This was a cool one I was looking up where, um, so obviously named after Mount Olympus, right? The home of the gods. Originally, it's a Japanese company. And originally it was named after the Japanese um, mountain that was supposed to be the kind of home of the mythological gods there. And it's kind of cool that they took the same concept. They just kind of basically westernized it and made it Olympus um, and uh, had it being the, the, the name for where the gods come from. We've got Atlas van lines, right? We talked about Atlas a little bit already. Um, this makes sense. I guess the reference, right, is that uh, just like Atlas is holding up the world, the Atlas van lines will hold up all your, all your crap as you carry it across the country. Pandora Radio. I don't think anybody listens to this anymore, but it was a thing at one point in time before Spotify existed. And um, the idea, right, is that like you can listen to all the songs just like Pandora has all the gifts. It's giving you all the gift of song, I guess. So many different things when it comes to marketing. Let's go ahead and before we run out of time here, get uh, our attendance done for today. Go ahead, Hercules or Heracles is looking very green looking very beefy. So go ahead and take a minute or two and get that into the attendance quiz. All right, a couple questions along the way, right? Um, uh, so uh, honors contracts, I haven't talked much about that. Once you finish it up, just go ahead and put your work in the folder on D2L, um, and it doesn't factor into your grade, okay? So the honors thing is like, if you did a, a good enough job, you get honors credit for it. If you don't turn it in, uh, you don't get the honors credit. In no way does it impact the actual letter grade 
uh, for the class. Um, uh, other questions, what about Hermes luxury brand? Hermes, Hermes, yes, also named after Hermes. I don't know, because Hermes was like a super luxurious god. He was kind of, he was like one of the gods of wealth, so you got that. Um, is the final open note? The final is open note, right? Uh, so go ahead and make sure all your stuff is organized. Uh, and use the midterm as a guide, right? If you like absolutely crush the midterm, um, you know, you can feel pretty confident that that level of preparation was an appropriate level of preparation. If you got owned by the midterm, apologies, not, not my intent, but if you did get owned by the midterm, use that as useful information as well. Study a little bit harder, do a little bit more organization so that you're ready to go. Um, another question, are we allowed to change our final project from what we said we'd do in our proposal? Absolutely, right? Again, this happens all the time in research. It changes for any number of reasons from their too many people who already did it, to there's not enough sources, to I just got bored of this thing and no longer want to do it anymore. Absolutely feel free to change things. You might want to check with your TA to make sure that the new idea is going to be feasible uh, and a, a productive idea to move forward with, but you can definitely do that. Will we get the potential essay questions? Yep, they are up online now. Um, so you can go to, uh, I think, today or tomorrow and find uh, the list of potential essay questions. All right, let's go ahead. Uh, mythology and medicine and science, right? We've got morphine and we've got Morpheus, right? So Morpheus, the god of sleep, uh, and morphine like puts you to sleep, takes away your pain, that sort of thing. Um, we've talked about right the uh, the caduceus and the rod of Asclepius as like mythological symbols that have been co-opted by medicine today, and we can see that in the. Uh, symbol for the American Medical Corps, right, with the caduceus. We can see the rod of Asclepius, right, the rod with the snake around it, um, uh, representing on the the um, shield, right, of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, and we get the story of Asclepius, right? You guys have already heard this, right? Apollo's in love with Cronus. Uh, the way that that plays out is after she sleeps with Apollo, she sleeps with like a mortal dude shortly after that. Um, and uh, Apollo gets really angry and throws her into a fire and then is like, oh, my tiny baby is in that fire and gets out tiny baby Asclepius uh, and then gives him to the centaur Chiron, right? Also the teacher of Achilles and Patroclus to raise him. And his big site, we talked about that earlier, was the site of Epidaurus, um, uh, not too far away from uh, Athens and Corinth. Okay, so... Uh, we, along the lines of like kind of medicine and psychology and science, right? We've also got uh, Freud's Oedipus complex. So if you remember the story of Oedipus, right? Um, he does slay the Sphinx by defeating it, by defeating its riddle, right? But he also ends up uh, killing his dad on the way to Thebes and then accidentally marrying his mom and getting busy with her and producing children with her. Uh, and Freud is saying that this is like what we all want to do or all of us dudes want to do, like deep down, is like kill our father and marry our mother. And then Carl Jung was like, not to be outdone, or just kind of being a copycat. He's like, uh-uh, chicks want to do that too, right? So basically, the ladies, they want to kill their mother and marry their father, uh, just like Electra um, ends up killing uh, her mother, Clytemnestra, uh, because her mother killed her dad. She doesn't actually sleep with her dad, so that's a little bit different. But, right, Freud says guys want to uh, basically kill, yeah, kill their dad, marry their mom. Jung is saying that uh, girls want to kill their mom, marry their dad. Um, in the realm of science, we've got titanium, right, obviously named after the titans, but also because it's buried deep within the earth, very difficult to extract, just like the titans are buried deep down uh, in Tartarus. We've also got Tantalum after Tantalus and Niobium after Niobe. Uh, the Apollo missions to the moon, right? Uh, those are done because uh, Apollo was a very skilled archer and able to like hit his target from very, very far away. And that was kind of the goal of those missions to be able to, you know, launch a, uh, you know, rocket and have it land on the moon. The Nike missile project, uh, the name of the missile project during the Cold War, um, so the first one was named, known as the Nike Ajax missile and then later the Nike Hercules missile. Um, but you can still go around in California, especially, and see these Nike missile sites. 
um, that were built as defenses to any possible invasion from the West. And then finally, we've got myth and literature to conclude today, right? And uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys have read the Percy Jackson stories, right? Um, and uh, obvious connections to Greek mythology. One of the cool kind of things there, right, is that it's uh, written by a guy whose son does have like ADHD. And that's kind of like one of the things that's put on the protagonist in the book. Um, but in the book, it's kind of explained by this like Olympian blood. And it's kind of cool in the sense that this is what Greek myths do all the time, right? Is they take something that's kind of difficult to comprehend, right? Like ADHD, uh, something kind of incomprehensible and come up with an explanation for why that's occurring. So kind of cool there. Um, Harry Potter, right? Also uh, tons of allusions, right? Like the Order of the Phoenix uh, to Greco-Roman mythology. He can kind of be seen in some ways as a less terrible Achilles uh, where he gets his his mother's blessing that makes him invincible. You can see other references throughout the text, right? Minerva McGonagall. Um, uh, and then the dog, right? Fluffy, who's kind of like Cerberus. Uh, Game of Thrones, this is one of the best ones. This is like, um, it's got allusions not just to Greco-Roman mythology, but also Greco-Roman history. Um, one of the ways that I like to think about uh, um, Game of Thrones is being representative of what we have in the Hellenistic world. OK, so basically what happens with Greek history, right? We got this great period of democracy. It kind of falls apart. Alexander the Great takes over everything, not just in Greece, but like all the way to India. And then he dies. Right. And in the aftermath of his death, he's built the largest empire the world's ever seen. And it's all of his successors, his like kid, uh, his brother in law, uh, his generals, they are all competing for different, uh, they're basically all competing to take over the empire. And the way that they do that is they split it up into different parts. And then they, they kind of are the kings of their own little parts, but they're still trying to fight to take over the whole thing once again. Um, so it's very similar uh, to, to that. Also, you could, you could say something similar for the Roman Empire um, uh, in the War of the Five Kings in 69 AD. You can get other references there too, right? Like the wall being like Hadrian's Wall, keeping out people to the north. Uh, you can get the Red Wedding um, as similar to the Wedding of Pirithus, right? The centaurs and the lapiths that's up on uh, the metopes um, of the Parthenon. Uh, or um, Jason's Wedding to Glauce, right? Uh, so you read some of that in the, the story of Medea being similar to the, the, the poisoning of the Purple Wedding. And then the mythology, right, of uh, the Game of Thrones world itself is very, very closely related to Greco-Roman mythology. When you look at the seven, right, the father with Jupiter and the mother with Juno and the maiden of Diana, um, the warrior of Mars, right, the smith of Vulcan, the stranger is Pluto. It maps on pretty darn well to that sort of thing. And then the other gods kind of map on as well, right? The old gods being kind of like the Titans, right, overthrown at some point in time, the drowned god being like Neptune. Uh, and Rolor, the, the Lord of Light, being something associated with this kind of new uh, incoming religion like Christianity. And then finally, right, the plot for the whole thing is kind of just the plot of like the Iliad and or, you know, the epic cycle uh, and the story of Helen and, uh, of Troy. Right. So one of the characters gets abducted. Um, basically, these groups have to ally together to go get that person back. And that's what kicks off not only the entire story that leads to the epic cycle in the Iliad, but also the entire story. Uh, that's the baseline for, for the Game of Thrones. So that is it for today. Great job listening to my lectures all semester. I know sometimes it was probably pretty difficult, but I hope you enjoyed some of them. Friday, we are looking at student projects. Monday, we are doing a review. Wednesday is the exam. Have a great couple days, guys, and I will see you on Friday. Bye, everyone.